My original title for the sermon was To Every Nation, Kindred, Tongue, and People, but um, I also had a, another title, Rainbow Over Snow- Storm Clouds, Rainbow Over Storm Clouds. Eventually, you'll see how those two fit together. Um, but uh, before we begin, again, let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we praise you and thank you for the privilege of studying your word of looking for the evidences of your providence in our lives and throughout the world in preparation for your coming. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. At the end of October 1991, two hurricane systems in the Atlantic Ocean collided, generating 100-foot rogue waves. This extremely rare event, this conversion, convergence, became known as the perfect storm. And actually, uh, this amazing event was recorded in both a book uh, and a film that came out uh, a few years later about this perfect storm. Since then, that expression, the perfect storm, has come to mean any overwhelming series of events that uh, seem unique um, and perhaps impossible almost to deal with. Both Daniel and Jesus both predicted that there would be a great time of trouble near the end of the world. In the Review and Herald, November 27, 1900, Ellen White wrote angels, or rather they, she wrote, a storm is coming relentless in, a, in its fury. A storm is coming And then just five years later, Review and Herald again, November, she wrote, Angels are now restraining the winds of strife until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene as no pen can picture. The good news is that Jesus is the master of the storm. And he's promised that he said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. During the um, worst part of the lockdown, COVID, earlier this year, uh, my friend Dave Rowe in Northern California, the one I've spoken of with muscular dystrophy, but of great and good courage, his wife I had a dream one evening, one night. And in the dream, she saw that the four angels were holding the winds of strife, but with something like a giant sheet. But one of the corners of the sheet had dropped to the ground. And I thought, wow, how uh, symbolic of what we see happening in this year of 2020. Uh, The storm is coming and the winds are increasing, the winds of trouble and strife. March of this year, the whole world was shut down within a few hours. This is an event unique in the world's history. Millions of lives were disrupted in economic, social, family, religious, civil, and political storms have resulted. And there's now a call for a new world order. A call, interestingly enough, coming from the top medical people, for complete restructuring of all society under the auspices of the United Nations. Nevertheless, the word of God, the good news of salvation and the second coming are going to all the world as never before. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. The emergence of the Bible societies, which began to flourish all over the world, started right after the end of the 1260-year time period, which ended in 1798. Um, And also 
these Bible, study, uh, Bible societies for the promotion, proclamation, distribution, translation of the Bible all happened just a short time also right after the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was supposed to be the end to religion, the end to God, and um, literally there was dancing in the streets because they thought all religion was going to be gone. But God had a different plan in mind. And shortly thereafter, uh, the Great Awakening began, which of course resulted in uh, the preaching of the second coming of Jesus Christ. But it's interesting to look at the dates connected to these Bible societies when they started. The British and Foreign Bible Society, 1804. The Bible Society of Ireland, 1806. Northern Ireland, 1807. The Scottish Bible Society, 1809. British Society, I'm sorry, the Bible Society of India, 1811. Finland, 1812. The Russian Bible Society in 1813. Um, Netherlands, 1814, uh, and it goes right on down. Now, the American Bible Society uh, began in 1816, and uh, it's a part of a, of a worldwide group of Bible societies which uh, have something like 190 members. Um, Bible Society of South Africa began in, in 1820. New Zealand, 1846. Um, the French Bible Society, 1901. Uh, some of them were a little late getting on board. Um, but we're thankful for the amazing work of these Bible societies, which God is using to bring the Bible to people all over the world. And what an amazing work they are doing. I remember recently, since I get the newsletters from from uh, American Bible Society, uh, there was a village, I think it was in Guatemala, and just recently they got the Bible for the first time in their own local dialect. Never had it happened before. And the entire town came out and they had this big parade, just people marching through town, holding banners, praising God that they finally had the Bible in their own mother tongue. And over and over again, as I, as I read these stories, um, people will say, even those that are multilingual, they can speak other languages, but once they have the Bible in their mother tongue, he said, now it's not just speaking to my mind, it's speaking to my heart. And they really, really connect, and we praise God uh, for the work they were doing. The, uh, back in 1917, a missionary named William Cameron Townsend went to Guatemala to sell Spanish Bibles, but he was shocked when many people uh, couldn't understand the books. They spoke Caquiquel, and I'm sure I mispronounced that one, uh, language without a Bible down there uh, in, in Guatemala area. And uh, so what this fellow did, he started linguistic school, um, called the Summer Institute of Linguistics, that trained people on how to do Bible translation. And, of course, that was a very important work because in many cases, these people didn't even have an alphabet. They didn't, nothing was written. And so the first challenge was to create the alphabet um, and, in essence, <laughs> transcribe the words that they were using into an alphabet they could read and teach them to read and then present the Bible to them. But the work, finally in 1942, uh, Mr. Townsend officially founded the Wycliffe Bible Translators. And there's a number of translation groups around the world. I believe this is one of the largest. Uh, the first translation was, was completed in 1951, and the 500th translation was completed in the year 2000. 500 different languages. Um, around the same time they adopted a new challenge the goal of getting a Bible translation project started in every language that still doesn't have one by the year 2025 and that's going to be a big challenge 
because there's still 2,000 languages in the world that do not have any portion of the Bible. And so there's a great, uh, great work to be done. And uh, we thank God for, for those that um, are doing this great work. I remember reading about uh, some Bible translation work that was going on um, many years ago, and I believe it was in Africa in one of the dialects. And um, they uh, were trying to figure out a word in the local language that they could translate from the Bible to mean to trust. And in this particular language group, this culture, they didn't have a word that meant trust somebody. I guess they must have been quite suspicious by nature. But they didn't have a word. And uh, so this uh, translator was, was agonizing with this and praying, you know, how can I find a word? Because that's so important in the whole Bible to have trust and faith. Um, we've got to be able to, tr- to find a word that they'll understand. So one day he noticed um, a man working in his garden, and um, he had a kind of a short hoe that he'd been working with. And he stopped. He was tired. It was hot. And he noticed the man was just leaning his whole weight on that hoe, just resting. And immediately the translator asked him, what do you call that when you lean your whole weight on something? And he gave him the word. And, of course, that was incorporated into the new translation. And that became the meaning of trust and faith, is to lean your entire weight on. And that's exactly what we do emotionally, spiritually, and every other way uh, with Jesus. We have others that that um, have spoken of what it's like when God's word comes to them. Uh, and in some areas of the world, it's very difficult to get the Bibles to them because of restrictions, the, the uh, anti-Christian culture. Um, they don't want it. They told one story of one of the um, uh, founders of, uh, of, in the Wycliffe movement, one of the leaders and the translators. Um, and he had gone, he was in Papua New Guinea, and he was uh, trying to get across. At nighttime, they had to go get to another village, and in between there was a, a treacherous ravine, um, and it was very, very dangerous to cross. And so, amazingly, he was able to make a call. You can think about making a cell phone call on Papua New Guinea. But I uh, made a call and it says, please, somebody come to the other side from your village and hold up a light so we can see where we're supposed to get to in this total darkness across this ravine and across this stream and all that. And, um, and finally, somebody came with a lantern um, and then a piece of burning wood, just kind of the old-fashioned way of a torch. Um, and he said, he knew then the friends were coming to rescue us. He said, I now know what it feels like to be in total darkness, desperately calling for someone with light. And that's the story of our world. People, so many people are in great darkness. But we have the privilege of sharing the light. Um, And we have the promise that uh, those that sat in darkness will see a great light. Um, And we realize that many people will choose not to accept the light, but we're thankful for those that are around the world. There's a lot of work being done for Israel by uh, Messianic Jews, people that have accepted Jesus Christ. And um, uh, there's an there's a organization called One for Israel, O-N-E, One for Israel. It's amazing, short, beautiful testimonies, and, and mostly from very, very talented people. I mean, scientists, engineers, doctors, people who who thought the only thing they knew about the word Jesus was a curse word. And, and um, but yet events came about in their life and circumstances, and they said they wanted to find out. And as they began to study, and in some cases, as they called out, you know, to Jesus, if you're there, Yeshua, Yeshua, if you were there, let me know, speak to my heart, let me know. And in many cases, they would have a dream, they would have a vision, 
They would have a, a presence of the Lord, and they would study studying the scriptures. And one of the amazing things is that um, in most of the, uh, or almost all the Jewish synagogues around the world, uh, of course, they primarily focus on the Torah, the first five books. They don't spend a lot of time in the rest of the Old Testament. They're aware of it, but they don't spend much time. And they will you know, pick text here and there. And they will actually read from Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 54 and skip Isaiah 53 deliberately, completely. They have for decades, for years, for centuries, I guess. When they are finally convicted to read Isaiah 53, they meet Jesus. Because this amazing prophecy of, of, of Jesus. There's another organization called Israel Media Ministries uh, by a fellow called Zev, uh, who uh, said for a long time he'd passed this little Christian uh, bookstore, and the one out of sheer curiosity, it was in Israel, he walked in, and the fellow said, Would you like to read the New Testament in Hebrew? And he said, why would I want to read the New Testament in Hebrew? New Testament's for Christians. The Old Testament's for Jews. And the father said, well, just try it. And he reads the story of Jesus and finds Jesus. And uh, Zev is now has tremendous work that he's also doing on the Internet. Um, he came and spoke at the uh, Country Life Church one evening. And it was just amazing how he said, once you... Find the, once the Jew finds the missing piece, which is Jesus, the whole scriptures, the whole Old Testament comes alive. It's Jesus everywhere. Yeshua everywhere. And I mean, um, I wish more, you know, born-again Christians had the excitement he has uh, in sharing the good news, and particularly with his own, with his own countrymen. There is worldwide persecution of Christians. Um, literally hundreds of thousands have been martyred um, in recent years, and particularly in the Sudan. Um, but yet, in spite of that, those who survive the attacks um, have been given the grace of God to be unafraid I get uh, the Voice of the Martyrs, which you can order. It's a free magazine. And they basically help the families, the surviving families of those that have lost their lives for Christ uh, to uh, have food and find work, in some cases move to a little safer location. But in some of the recent issues, they talked about the joy of fellowship and um, how even this was this year that these people refuse to stay home and quarantine. They said, God has called us to fellowship, to worship. And they will not give up. In some cases, even when their churches have been bombed out completely, they go back, and most of them are Sunday keepers. Um, but from the pictures, they definitely believe in baptism by immersion. They love Jesus. And there they are, standing in the rubble. Well, the churches just got bombed the week before having a church service for God. We ought to follow their example, or call to follow their example. Um, another story of uh, uh, a lot of persecution is having in Sri Lanka. Now, we've heard about Muslim extremists and uh, Hindu extremists. Well, now they're Buddhist extremists. Buddhist is supposed to be the religion of peace. Well, not anymore. Um, they're on a warpath against Christians and uh, attacking. And this family, this, this mother and her daughter, lost the rest of all of their family in, a, in a, an attack by the, uh, by the Buddhists. And yet, this little girl, totally unafraid, sharing Jesus, knowing it could cost her life, but she's still unafraid because she has met Jesus. We're so thankful for those who are coming to Jesus um, through every means possible. Certainly Adventist World Radio is doing, doing a tremendous work in reaching millions. Um, 
There's been several series going on. I know that it is written. It has a series, a number of them doing on the Internet. And a recent series, which has been continuing um, from Adventist World Radio by Cami Utman, Unlocking Bible Prophecies. And uh, if you just go to awr.org slash Bible, you can just go back and watch the series. But very, very beautifully done. Um, and are reaching people and literally in both the original series back in, I think, March, April, or I guess April, May, rather, and the more recent series, in both cases, millions of people watching all around the world. And so we praise God uh, for what is happening. Um, back in 19, I'm sorry, in, in 2015, there uh, was a lady by the name of Joy Kaufman, who has her master's in public health, and she's also a master gardener. And she had gone to Africa to actually work for one of the government uh, programs to help people um, do better farming. And uh, she realized that there was a very special opportunity for our church to be able to reach out people, especially in Africa, but they're doing some work now in Cuba and other places. Um, And so in just a short amount of time, um, they uh, created, she with a, a small group of people, created this, something they called Farm Stew. Farm Stew, F A R M and then S T E W. And what this means, what it stands for, the acronym Farming, Attitude, Rest, Meals, Sanitation, Temperance, Enterprise, Water. The little groups are training people how to have better gardens, um, how to irrigate better, how to have you know little uh, flocks, chickens, goats, things that they can do, helping them to get started, helping them to grow enough so they can sell some food and then have a little bit left over to be able to send their kids so they can go to school. Um, they also teach them how to, even with a plastic you know, gallon jug, milk jug, how they can use that to have running water to wash their hands. Um, It's uh, amazing what they're also um, teaching them sanitation and all these areas and how to prepare their meals better. And it's been so successful as they are training and then they train others and they get a certificate when they've gone through the training and then they can go to another village and train more people in this little program. And they've now, just since that time period, uh, since 2015, have been able to help 120,000 people have better lives. Absolutely amazing. If you go to farmstew.org, amazing story um, of how God is leading and working in such uh, amazing ways. And it tells the story of one lady who... uh, um, learn how to have a have a garden. She was having a good garden, for you know, it was really really doing better for the first time, and she was so happy. But her neighbors had chickens, and the chickens were coming over to eat her garden, and you know she was a little unhappy with the neighbors, and she's you know praying what to do, what to do, and um, then she learned how to have a hanging garden to get it off the ground have a hanging garden, which the chickens weren't interested in. And now this neighbor who, whose relations had been a bit strained for a while, uh, now she's coming and buying vegetables from, from her neighbor. Um, but over and over again, these amazing stories of how God is taking simple ideas to make a wonderful difference. I remember hearing about uh, one man uh, just recently who was in a little village, I think he was in northern India, and India has been locked down much tighter than we have. And um, apparently these people in this area had to go a long distance to get water at one little you know, well. And, um, but the local government authorities said that even if they came for, the, to, for water, they could not talk to each other. So how are you going to share the gospel if you can't talk? Well, this Adventist fella got a hold of one of these God pods, one of these little MP3 players, 
You know, they have, they have the, I guess, the chip in there and has all the Bible lessons. And so he went, and he would just stay there to help everybody else get their water and his water too. But the whole time he was playing the God plod out loud, and they were getting Bible lessons, uh, and he didn't say a word. Testimonies, Volume 9, 109. Uh, if we would humble ourselves before God, be courteous, tenderhearted, and pitiful, that is, full of pity, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where there's now only one. Amazing what God can do through kindness, thoughtfulness, courtesy, and helpfulness. Uh, several years ago, there was a, um, a retreat for youth leaders here in North America. I forget which conference or union it was in. But um, the the leader of the program that weekend was really gung-ho. Uh, loved to get up early in the morning. And, and so she had all her little staff get together at 6 a.m. in the morning to uh, study the Bible. And uh, she was one of these type of people who was a morning person. The rest of them were not. Uh, and so, but, you know, they were there. And uh, so this one morning she said, um, I want everyone to think of your favorite Bible text and then tell us what it means to you. And, you know, they're all just quickly thinking, thinking, thinking. Uh, you know. And then she points to one young woman and said, would you tell us what, you, you know, what your verse is? And the young woman said, Jesus wept. All the others kind of sighed because they were hoping to find a real short verse like that too. And, um, but the young woman went and said, let me tell you why this means so much to me. She said, because I've had a lot of tears in my short life. There's been a lot of trauma, a lot of sadness and sorrow. And she says, when I read this story that Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, that tells me that Jesus understands our tears and that he weeps with us. Another story that I, I read just recently, um, a, a little four-year-old boy um, went over and sat on the lap of a grandpa, not his grandpa, but somebody else's grandpa, who had just lost his wife. And the mother at a distance saw the little boy there with Grandpa, and Grandpa was crying. And afterwards, she asked her son, what did you say to the man? And the little boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. You think about the, the theology in that. Uh, to, to weep with those that weep, to rejoice with those that weep, to care uh, and I thought that was such an amazing illustration of what God is calling us to do. 4,400 years ago, Noah and his family had just survived the greatest storm in history, the flood. They lost everything but life itself, lost everyone but their immediate family. They'd lost their homes and they lost an earth that was like the Garden of Eden. And they just spent a year in a floating zoo and landed on a pile of rocks. Noah needed encouragement. The future looked stormy. He needed hope. But God provided a promise. Big, bold, beautiful, breathtaking. That rainbow of promise. And what is a rainbow? Light from the first day of creation and water from the second day. And never before had there been a rainbow. And then he told them what it would mean, that it would be his promise to them. And we have in the scriptures a rainbow of God's promises throughout scripture that tell us of his care, of his love, of his coming. <coughs> in fact, the very first promise given to Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, his seed and your seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
And then in Genesis 22, when, when Abraham was asked by Isaac, Father, here's the wood and the fire, but where's, where's, the, offer, where's the lamb? And um, Abraham, inspired by God, gave the promise of the Messiah. He said, My son God will provide himself a lamb. And then in Isaiah 53, the very chapter that, praise God, some Jews are finally starting to read. Um, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And of course, the famous, most famous verse in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you've, I'm sure, had a chance to be in a motel, most motels have the Gideon Bibles. And in the front of the Gideon Bible is a list of, or, or a description, John 3.16, about 30 or 40 different languages. It's fun to look at it. Some of the European languages, you can see some of the connections, the words, a little more difficult when it gets into the uh, languages from the Far East. Uh, but nevertheless, beautiful from Genesis to Revelation, we are surrounded by the rainbow of God's promises. In fact, Revelation 4.3 says that there's a rainbow around God's throne. This actually represents God's justice surrounded by his mercy. And you remember in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, there were his law down on the inside, the Ten Commandments. And above that, was the mercy seat. And above that was the Shekinah, the immediate presence of God. Many years ago, there was a hymn written, which is, at least I didn't find it in our current hymnal. It may have been probably in some of the older hymnals. And um, it was written by Charles Albert Tinley in 1905. Uh, he was the son of a slave and a free mother, um, and he uh, became a pastor and wrote this song, Stand By Me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest the winds and the waters, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assail, when my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I do the best I can and my friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in war array undertake to stop my way, thou who saved Paul and Silas, stand by me. And when I'm growing old and feeble and stand by me, when my life becomes a burden and I'm nearing the chilly Jordan, O thou the lily of the valley, stand by me. Beautiful hymn by Charles Albert Tinley, the son of a slave. But he knew Jesus, and he knew his Bible. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mighty work in these stormy times. Guide us as the master of the ship, the master of the storm, to that safe harbor. In Jesus' name, amen.